Hello everyone, this is a preview on pediatric nephrology. Proteinuria. Proteinuria. If you do a dip stick and the dip stick is 1 plus or 30 milligram per deciliter, this is considered proteinuria. Why proteinuria is important? Because persistent proteinuria is a red flag, is a signal of glomerular lesion or glomerular disease. Why is it important? Because this can progress to end stage renal failure. So if you do a dip stick, you have possibilities can be negative or you can see a trace. Trace means 10 to 20 milligram per deciliter. Uh, 1 plus means 30 milligram per deciliter. 2 plus means 100 milligram per deciliter. And 3 plus means 300 milligram per deciliter. 4 plus means 1000 to 1500 milligram per deciliter or more. This is a 12 year old boy is presenting with frequent urination and irritation of the glands. He denied having any fever, no abdominal pain, no vomiting, no other symptoms. A physical exam showed mild redness in the glands, no tenderness, and no discharge. Urinalysis is 3 positive plus for protein. The urine test is negative for nitrites and no leukocyte esterase. The urine culture is negative. What is the best next step? Start to oral antibiotic for UTI. Do urine protein creatinine ratio on the first morning sample and another on upright position. VCUG renal ultrasound or reassurance the correct answer is urine protein creatinine ratio in the first morning sample and another on upright position why because this is an incidental finding of protein urea in a healthy adolescent most likely this is orthostatic protein urea but to confirm the diagnosis we have to do the protein creatinine ratio in the first morning sample then another on upright position Clinical approach to a child with proteinuria. First thing to advise the parents to uh, ask the child or to let the child empty the bladder before going to sleep to ensure removal of residual protein from the previous day. The next step is to collect the first morning sample immediately after waking up from the bed to the bathroom before playing, before any activity in order to ensure the correct uh, collection of first morning sample. Then the next step is to send the urine test for protein and creatinine ratio. So you order protein and creatinine urine test and then you divide the protein over the creatine and this will give you the ratio. If the ratio is less than or equal 0.2, this is normal in a child more than 2 years of age. If you collect the urine sample, the morning sample, and if you do dip stick and is more than 1 plus or urine protein to urine creatinine ratio is more than 0.2 remember this number more than 0.2 on a repeat urine morning sample this is suggestive of renal disease this is serious this is requires further investigation orthostatic proteinuria if you have a clinical presentation of a tall adolescent active slender body uh, habitus with significant proteinuria and upright position and resolve in supine position the most likely diagnosis is Orthostatic proteinuria, this is a classic presentation of orthostatic proteinuria, so what to do next? Advise the patient to empty the bladder before bedtime and immediately after waking up, uh, collect the first morning sample and test for urine protein and urine creatinine. So in this case of orthostatic proteinuria, you will see during the day on random sample, you will see that protein to creatinine ratio is more than uh, 0.2 on a random sample. But when you do the first morning sample, you will see the protein creatinine ratio is less than 0.2 on the first morning sample. Protein urea during the day or activity and disappeared in supine position with normal first morning urine sample. This is a benign condition requires reassurance, but uh, testing for protein urea in annual basis is prudent. Very important to uh, follow up on yearly basis and anytime you see the first morning sample is uh, one plus or more or the uh, first morning sample urine protein to urine creatinine ratio is more than 0.2 this will require uh, further investigations a child on lasix diuretics presents with oliguria elevated creatinine urine osmolarity is more than 400 and urine sodium is less than 20 and diffractionated sodium less than 1% urine is positive for hyaline cast what is the most likely diagnosis pre-renal acute kidney injury or acute tubular necrosis or post-renal acute kidney injury or renal tubular acidosis the correct answer is pre-renal acute kidney injury why because this child is having oliguria 
and elevated creatinine and urinary osmolarity is more than 400 so the kidney is still healthy able to concentrate the urine and able to reabsorb the sodium so the uh, urine sodium is low and the fractionated uh, sodium is less than one percent so this is the key for the pre-renal injury the urine uh, osmolarity is high able to concentrate the urine and the urine sodium is low and the fractionated sodium is less than one percent so this is a case of pre-renal acute kidney injury let's understand how pre-renal acute kidney injury develop if you remember is because of decreased renal blood flow decreased renal blood flow will decrease the gfr causes of decreased blood flow or renal blood flow to the kidney like hypovolemia dehydration or hypoperfusion like in cases of heart failure shock sepsis anaphylaxis all these factors will decrease the, the gfr and when the gfr is decreased the kidney start to react will stimulate the renin angiotensin system and this system will release aldosterone the aldosterone will go and work on the healthy renal tubules by increasing the sodium reabsorption and as a result of that you will have low urinary sodium you will have less fina or fractional uh, excretion sodium will be less than one percent or low urinary sodium less than 10 but along with the sodium will be also water so the kidney will reabsorb more water and will it will be able to concentrate the urine at least remember the urine will be concentrated the urine osmolarity will be high uh, more than 400 older children more than 315 neonates so remember low urinary sodium and concentrated urine or high urine osmolarity because the kidney is healthy is able to concentrate the urine so the aldosterone will take more water and with the water will go more bun so the bun will be increased in the blood so in this case the bun to creatinine ratio will be more than 15 normal is 15 in this case will be increased so finally remember that in pre-renal acute kidney injury you will have uh, the bun to creatinine ratio is increased low urinary sodium and high urine osmolarity why because the renal tubules is healthy and the aldosterone is able to work on it with no problem if you do not treat these children on time uh, this will cause damage to the renal tubules and will move from pre-renal to renal acute kidney injury and the problem will be worse and all these numbers will change be familiar with the key words and differential diagnosis for intrinsic or renal acute kidney injuries. If you have a patient with muddy, brown, granular cast, this is a key word for acute tubular necrosis. Acute tubular necrosis is commonly uh, from transformation of pre-renal acute kidney injuries. Common medications associated with this condition is aminoglycosides, methotrexate, amphotericine, intravenous contrast, uh, toxin mediated like uh, myoglobinuria. So treating pre-renal condition uh, on time you may save the patient to develop this condition acute tubular necrosis and damage to the renal tubules if you have a patient with hematuria dark brown urine tea colored urine hypertension develop the two to three weeks after uri or streptococcal infection this is post infectious glomerulonephritis in this case c3 will be low and c4 will be normal if you have a patient with gross hematuria one uh, two three days or uh, during uh, uri or upper respiratory tract infection this is iga nephropathy if you do c3 and c4 they will be normal both if you have a patient with arthritis discoid rash malar rash photosensitivity cirrhositis this is lupus nephritis in this case a and a will be positive uh, anti double strand DNA will be positive. C3 and C4 both will be low. Nocturnal enuresis, the new name primary monosymptomatic nocturnal enuresis. Family history or positive family history is very common. If one parent is uh, had nocturnal enuresis, the chance is high. If both parents ha had nocturnal enuresis, the chance is even higher. Uh, very important to know the difference between boys and girls this disease is more common in boys but in generally boys uh, are very common to be continent day and night after age of eight and the girls they are continent day and night after age of six so this is very important to know for reassurance nocturnal enuresis is a diagnosis of exclusion you need to exclude all organic causes and other causes of enuresis before you come to this diagnosis nocturnal enuresis so careful history of fluid intake at night, daytime voiding pattern, make sure it is uh, at night only not during the day, uh, number and timing of episodes of bedwetting. First test to do urinalysis. If you see glucose in urine, 
you need to do full workup for diabetes mellitus. If you see low urine osmolarity or low urine specific gravity, this makes you suspicion of diabetes insipidus. If there is a high white blood cells in the urine or positive urine culture, this is UTI. Uh, this is very important to do before you come to the diagnosis or start treatment for nocturnal enuresis. Very important to be familiar with the differential diagnosis of nocturnal enuresis. History and physical examination is the key for the correct diagnosis and the proper treatment. The first one is overactive bladder, very sensitive bladder. So uh, children with overactive bladder or dysfunction, they are always irritable. They are standing on tiptoes when they have the desire to go to the bathroom, crossing legs, squatting with heels pressed into the perineum. Neurogenic bladder because of neurological damage. A small bladder capacity, the bladder is too small, cannot hold too much urine. Excessive urination at night, nocturnal polyuria, cystitis infection. A sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, very important to know that can be associated with nocturnal enuresis. So if you remove the adenoid, if you remove the tonsils and no more sleep apnea, this will correct the nocturnal enuresis with no further treatment. A major motor seizure or seizures can be associated with nocturnal enuresis. Ectopic ureter, the key here that the child is never dry, always wet. A constipation. Uh, diabetes mellitus, of course, and diabetes insipidus. So again, history, physical examination is the key. Nocturnal polyuria means excessive urination at night. If the urine production at night is more than 130% of the child's expected bladder capacity, how you can calculate the EBC? The EBC equal 30 ml plus age in years time 30 ml. This will give you that. So if it's more than 130%, this will give you the diagnosis of nocturnal polyuria. Small bladder capacity, also the same calculation, frequent small voids during the day and of course at night. Treatment of nocturnal enuresis. Step number one, to reassure the parents that this condition is self-limited and most of the children will grow out of nocturnal enuresis. You need to exclude all other causes before you start treatment of nocturnal enuresis. Fluid restriction in the evening is moderately successful, but it's very important to keep the child well hydrated and encourage fluid intake during the day. Just restrict in the evening. Acute treatment should be avoided before age of six. Motivational therapy, avoid punishment and uh, reward for dry nights. Reward for dry nights is very effective. After doing all of that, uh, the first line of treatment is conditioning therapy, bedwetting alarm. So what happened here, there is, there is a sensor uh, attached to the uh, underwear and there is an alarm. And when the sensor become wet for with the first few drops of urine, the alarm will start and will wake everybody in the house. So it's very loud and the parents, as soon as they hear the alarm, they should go to the child room and lead the child to the bathroom, okay, and uh, to let the child urinate. Then we'll take the child back and they, the child has to help with the changing the bedding before goes to sleep. And you do that for uh, 8 to 12 weeks to, in order to see effect. After that, successfully, this can cause make the child dry at night and treat nocturnal enuresis. After uh, 12 weeks or more, if this is not successful, you go to the next step, desmopressine. Desmopressine is antidiuretic hormone, will decrease the urine production at night because it will be given only at night. So very important to advise the parent, no drinking water whatsoever after taking the medicine. Why? Because this will cause retention of the fluid. And as a result of that, it will be associated with hyponatremia if the child keep drinking water after taking the desmopressin because the kidney will, be, will not produce enough urine. And this can cause seizure. And if this is severe and the child drank a lot of water, this can cause even death. It is rare, but it's very important to consider. Very important to give this advice once you prescribe this medicine. Having trouble or trying to pass the pediatric board exam? We have the definitive solution for you. Presenting the Last Minute Review Series, a powerful tool for achieving success in pediatric board exams. Crafted by Dr. Osama Naga, a board-certified pediatrician by American Board of Pediatrics and the editor of the Pediatric Board Study Guide, a Last Minute Review. Dr. Naga breaks down the most critical subjects in this series. The Pediatric Last Minute Review webpage offers a thorough and rigorous set of pediatric board review sessions that are in line with the study guide. The lectures will cover the most important topics for each condition that a pediatrician must know for pediatric board exams, as well as real-life clinical encounters. The inclusion of a clinical case scenario, accompanied by multiple-choice questions, 
followed by the most probable answer and a comprehensive description of the issue, will ensure test readiness for each student. You will be able to download the lecture's PDF files to make your studies easier, to take notes and be accessible on the go and offline. Based on the membership plan you choose, you will have unlimited access to the lectures for either one month, three months, six months, or one year. By viewing these videos, you will increase your chances of passing the board exam and gain substantial advantages from the acquired knowledge. Additionally, by studying the material and completing the AAP prep questions from the previous three years, you will greatly increase your likelihood of passing the board and will acquire a wealth of knowledge. Click on the link provided below to visit lastminutepediatric.com and subscribe immediately. Be sure to take advantage of our free video samples on our YouTube channel, Pediatric Board Last Minute Review. Good luck with your exams.